Okay, so suppose that you come up with a new cryptographic scheme, okay? And now you would like to prove the scheme secure. I guess this is a situation that most of us here can relate to. So the first question that you have to ask is, in what kind of model do you prove security? So ideally, um, we would like to conduct any proof in the standard model, which is basically to prove it without any simplifying assumptions. But in many cases, this is uh, going to be very difficult, and in some cases, even impossible. Okay, and uh, whenever this happens, then we have to resort to idealized models instead. Okay, so idealizing the real world, uh, but how? So in some sense, the goal is to abstract away as many non-essential properties of the real world as possible. Okay, and uh, once we've done this, then we can prove statements in this simplified and idealized model. And of course, the intuition is that uh, if we manage to do this idealization in a non-trivial and non-oversimplifying way, then uh, proofs that we carry out in this model will also hold some meaning for the real world. So here are some notable examples of idealized models. Okay, the first one is, of course, the random oracle model, which is a model that idealizes hash functions. So in this model, any hash function is treated as a completely random function that returns uniformly random values when it sees fresh uh, inputs. And the second uh, idealized model is the generic group model introduced by Shoup, which basically idealizes cyclic groups. Okay, and this is uh, going to be the main, or is, is going to be a very important model for this talk. Okay, so for this reason, I would actually like to um, explain a bit about the, the models, that are, uh, about the algorithms that are considered in the generic group model. Okay, so the generic group model basically models all algorithms as generic algorithms. So what is a generic algorithm? A generic algorithm is an algorithm that uh, computes over a group G as, as follows. It only computes in the following two ways. If you give it two elements A and B, then it can use this abstract group operation, which I've denoted here with a circle, to compute a new group element C from these two elements. Okay, this is the first thing that it can do. And the second thing that it can do is it can check by comparison whether two elements are equal or not. Okay, and these are the only two things that a generic algorithm can do. Okay, so here are some pros of generic group algorithms. So the first one is that they work in every cyclic group. And even more so, they, have the, they take the same number of steps to compute the same problem over every group. So this is a very nice property. Okay, a second very nice property of these algorithms is that due to their uh, simplistic nature, it's actually possible to prove information theoretic lower bounds on them. So you can prove how many steps it takes to compute solutions to certain cryptographic uh, assumptions like uh, discrete logarithm problems, CDH, DDH, and actually many, many more important assumptions. So that's also a very nice property. Okay, and lastly, um, actually, we know some elliptic curves for which we don't know any algorithms which, are, which perform better than the generic ones. So there, this seems to be a very fitting abstraction. Okay, but of course, these uh, algorithms or this class of algorithms also has some drawbacks, okay? So the first main drawback is that for many groups, they're actually representation-based exploits. So for example, if you have a group in which the group elements are represented as integers, then you can do all sort of, uh, of stuff that you can't do over an elliptic curve, for example. So for example, you could compute Jacobi symbols, you can run index ca uh, calculus-based attacks, um, so, and these things tend to uh, work, work much faster than uh, generic algorithms. Other groups, for example, admit to compute pairings to gain additional information. So there is a lot of stuff that you can do over non-generic groups. Okay, then a second sort of con of the generic group model is that deriving these lower bounds takes combinatorial arguments, which are usually very complicated, and it's tedious to carry them out. And uh, even more so, these bounds are sort of not modular. That means that if you come up with a new cryptographic scheme and now you want to prove it's secure, then you have to do these bounds all over, which is also sort of tedious. Okay, so this talk will be about a new um, idealized model, which we call the algebraic group model. Uh, I will just abbreviate this as AGM from, uh, from here on out. Okay, so um, this model makes strictly weaker model assumptions than the generic group model, as I will show. Um, and as such, it lies between the generic group model and the standard model. Um, we hope that because of this, it actually uh, 
sort of improves our uh, approximation of reality because it makes uh, less strong assumptions than the generic group model. Okay, uh, and finally, what's also a very nice property that this model has, and I will also try to show this in some examples towards the end of the talk, uh, it allows for very easy reduction-based proofs. Okay, so now let's look at the main type of algorithm that we will consider in this model. Uh, this type of algorithm is called an algebraic algorithm. So what is an algebraic algorithm? An algebraic algorithm is an algorithm that takes a list of group elements. I've denoted it here with this uh, list L of group elements L0 to LK. So it takes these group elements and it computes a new group element and it returns this. So X here would be the new group element that the algorithm A computes. And whenever it outputs a newly computed group element, then it also outputs a representation vector Z. Okay, and this representation vector Z is of the following form. It allows us to write X as the product of these group elements Li from the input raised to the powers of Zi. Okay, so basically, an algebraic algorithm always tells us how it computes new group elements. That's the main idea. Okay, so here's some background on algebraic algorithms. So they were first introduced in the formalization, or vaguely the same formalization that I just showed you by Payet and Vergniaud in 2005. And so they're actually a very well-studied uh, class of, of algorithms. Um, so far, however, they have been used mostly to derive impossibility results, okay? And uh, these impossibility results usually look as follows. So you would say you have some uh, cryptographic scheme, which uh, you want to prove security for, and you have an underlying hardness assumption. Okay, and then you show via the meter reduction technique that there cannot be uh, an algebraic reduction between these two things, because otherwise you could break the underlying hardness assumption efficiently, and this is a contradiction. So this is the way that these uh, class of algorithms had a, uh, have actually been looked at so far, mostly. There, there are some exceptions, though. So um, Abdallah et al. At, in a paper at uh, S&P 2015 also consider an algebraic adversary in one of their security proofs. And uh, this is also the key idea of our new model. Okay, so in our model, similar to the generic group model, all al algorithms will be treated as algebraic algorithms. Okay, and this means in particular that we also consider uh, all adversaries in security games as algebraic algorithms. Okay, so I will now show in the, in the following slides that this actually gives us strictly weaker model assumptions than what we have in the generic group model. Okay, so here's the argument. It's very simple, actually. So as I said, basically, um, the class of algebraic algorithms is the class of algorithms that we can watch while they're working. So we see how they compute new group elements from all of their inputs. And of course, this is in particular true for a, for a generic uh, group algorithm. Why? Because all a generic algorithm can do is it can take two elements from its input and it can combine them via the generic group operation. And whenever it does this and outputs such a group element, then of course we see how it computed them, and this is why we get the representation vector here for free. So this means that every generic algorithm is also an algebraic algorithm. Okay. So another very nice property that we have here is that uh, bounds from the generic group model compose with uh, reductions that we carry out in the algebraic group model. Uh, so let me show what I mean by this. So we have a composition theorem that says the following. So suppose that we have um, some kind of lower bound on a computational problem S in uh, the generic group model. So we have some kind of bound that says it takes this many steps to compute a solution with a certain probability for this problem S. And now we manage to prove a reduction in the AGM from some problem T to the problem S, okay? And now suppose that this reduction is actually by means of a generic algorithm. Okay, and then our composition theorem says that um, we also derive in this manner a fresh or, or new bound for the computational problem T in the generic group model without having to go through the um, proof in the actual generic group model. So this is a very nice thing. Okay. Okay, so here's just a very short intermediate summary. In the generic group model, we use combinatorial arguments to derive lower bound on the number of steps uh, it takes to solve a problem, but in the AGM, we use reductions. And this is actually what I want to show now in the second half of my talk, like how do we use the AGM now that I've sort 
sort of, I, well, I, I hope that I motivated it uh, enough now. So, but now I want to show you how to actually use it and that I, I also want to show you that it uh, is simple to use. Okay, so somehow the goal is to uh, make use of this representation vector Z because this is what we get for free in the uh, algebraic group model and we don't get in the standard model. So that's sort of going to be the roadmap. Okay, so here's a very simple example of um, a lemma that we can prove in the algebraic group model, which basically says that breaking CDH algebraically is as hard as solving the discrete logarithm problem. Okay, so we have a lemma that reduces the discrete logarithm problem to the CDH problem tightly. Okay, so just as a quick reminder, the CDH problem is to compute g to the x, y, given g, g to the x, and g to the y, whereas the discrete logarithm problem is given g to the u, compute u. Okay, so here is a sketch of the reduction. Um, so we have on the left-hand side um, a solver for the discrete logarithm problem. So it wants to compute this uh, u in the exponent here. And on the right-hand side, we have an algebraic adversary which solves the CDH problem, okay? So now, in some way that I will shortly explain, this uh, discrete logarithm solver will come up with these elements g, g to the x, and g to the y, and it will send them to the algebraic algorithm. Now, the algebraic algorithm um, computes its solution, g to the x, y, and it sends back the solution, okay? So that's the second arrow. But of course, because it's an al algebraic adversary, it also includes this representation vector z with the components a, b, and c. Okay, so these components a, b, and c will be such that g to the x, y can be written as g to the x raised to the power of a, g to the y raised to the power of b times g to the c. Okay, so now denoting p as the prime uh, group order of this group, we can directly translate this into a modular equation. Okay, so it's x, y uh, modulo p is equal to x, a plus y, b plus c. Okay, now so let's rearrange the terms here and um, then we get this uh, equation which we can solve for x. So we can always solve this equation for x unless the adversary manages to set y equal to a. Then we get a zero here in the denominator and we cannot solve this. So the idea now is to, um, or for the discrete logarithm solvers to do the following. It will take its uh, discrete logarithm challenge u and with probability one half, it will either hide it into g to the x or into g to the y, okay? And the trick is of course that the adversary on the right side doesn't see the difference, okay? Because the discrete logarithm solver can just uh, choose the other element uniformly at random and these distributions will look totally identical. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, so now in the first case, uh, when y is not equal to a, then with probability one half, the discrete logarithm solver will have hidden its uh, discrete logarithm challenge in g to the x, and then we can solve for x and find the discrete logarithm in this way. But in the case where y equals a, then with probability one half, again, the discrete logarithm solver will have hidden its, its uh, discrete logarithm challenge into g to the y and have chosen the other element uniformly at random, and then basically the adversary returns the solution a equals y for free. Okay, so this reduction always works with probability one half times the probability of the algebraic adversary solving CDH. Okay, so here is another example of something that we uh, prove here. So we also prove uh, a similar reduction from the discrete logarithm problem to the strong Diffie-Hellman assumption, okay? So this assumption is a bit more complicated. Here the adversary also gets a DDH oracle to some sort of fixed basis kind of, uh, so, so the DDH oracle is slightly restricted here. So uh, one of the, of the elements in this DDH triple will always be set to g to the x from the CDH assumption. Okay, so this uh, makes it a slightly weaker uh, assumption than the related gap Diffie-Hellman assumption. So this assumption is used for DHIES, hash diagramant, and actually also in some other places. And uh, as I said, we can also prove here uh, a reduction between the discrete logarithm problem and the strong Diffie-Hellman problem. So just as another example of something we can prove. Okay, and then actually we can go even further so here you have the LRSW assumption. So it doesn't really matter how this assumption works, but it's a very interactive assumption. So um, the adversary in this assumption gets to query uh, an oracle many times, and every time it queries this oracle, the oracle returns uh, three group elements to the adversary. 
And finally, the adversary has to output, um, well, it's a signature game, basically. It has to output a forgery, which is also a group element. But because it has seen so many different group elements over the course of this game, it has a lot of freedom to compute this group element in its output. Okay, and this makes the reduction very complicated. But uh, we still managed to do it, and if you're interested, then you can read how to do it in our paper. So this assumption is very important because it forms the basis of uh, kamenisch lysianskaya uh, signatures, which are used in RFID tags, uh, anonymous credentials, and in, and in some other places as well. And here we also managed to prove a reduction between the discrete logarithm problem and this problem here. <coughs> okay, so just very shortly, we have some more results. One of them is a tight reduction of the BLS signature scheme, which is a short pairing-based signature scheme also to the discrete logarithm problem. So this is actually quite interesting because there is a theorem by Coron that prohibits such a type reduction because the signature scheme is a unique signature scheme. And the reason that we can sort of circumvent this impossibility result in the AGM is because uh, in the AGM we have non-black box access to the algebraic solver. Okay, and Coron's theorem only works if the reduction is a black box reduction. So this is why we can circumvent this impossibility result here. Then we also have a reduction from the CCA1 security of the Algamal crypto system to a Q-type variant of DDH. And similarly, we have a very nice proof of a zero knowledge snark by Groth from Eurocrypt 2016 to a Q-type variant <coughs> of the discrete logarithm problem. Okay, so some other candidates that we could analyze are basically any kind of candidates that we would now analyze in the generic group model. So if instead you can analyze them in the algebraic group model, then it's actually good because you're proving something stronger. Okay, and so ideal uh, kind of uh, primitives to analyze here would of course be structure preserving signatures or also like in the last slide, zero knowledge snarks. Okay, so let me just uh, give a summary of my talk here. So I introduced the AGM, which lies in between the generic group model and the standard model of computation. Okay, so it's reduction-based, and it's easy to work with, as I showed you. Um, it captures a very broad class of important algorithms, and it circumvents some impossibility results for black box reductions. Okay, and as a very nice uh, sort of side property, results from the AGM also carry over to the GGM because it's more general than the GGM. And also we have this composition theorem, which is very nice. So I would like to conclude with some open questions. So the first open question is, can we maybe prove some meta theorems which reduce a broader class of assumptions to a, maybe another class of assumptions? So right now we played around with the model a bit. We tried to find some reductions between some computational assumptions and uh, we have some results, but maybe there is like a general statement that can be made here. Also, can we maybe find automated proof tools which work in the AGM? So there are certain tools that uh, can be used to analyze uh, security properties, for example, of signature schemes in the generic group model. Maybe it's also possible to extend this idea to the algebraic group model. Um, then maybe can we prove some possibility results along the lines of Alexander Dent at AsiaCrypt 2002? So basically what he shows is that uh, there are some schemes that are uh, secure in the generic group model but are insecure pathologically when instantiated in the real world. So maybe it's also possible to come up with such schemes which, are, which can be proven secure in the algebraic group model instead. This would be interesting. Then actually a uh, non-trivial extension is to uh, make this work also for composite order groups. So here the argument becomes a bit more complicated and uh, so we also want to look at this in the future. And finally, uh, this is sort of the main open question, is, uh, is it possible to maybe extend also the algebraic group model to reasonably capture also decisional assumptions? Because right now, it is really tailored mostly to cover computational assumptions. If the uh, algebraic algorithm doesn't return a group element at the end of the game, then we can't really harness anything from this model, right? So it would be nice if maybe we could reasonably capture also decisional assumptions along the same lines. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you for listening.